I'm not a, a huge fan of trying new things. There's enough change in my life, enough variables to kind of keep it exciting for me that if there's something I can control, I, I generally like to keep it under control. So like lunchtime for me is kind of a big deal. So I do love food and I really like lunch a lot. But my lunchtime choices are fairly limited. I go to like two places, maybe three, if I'm feeling really adventurous. And it's not because like my, my taste in food is really limited. It's just, I, I, wanna, I wanna know where to park. I wanna know what door to go in. Um, actually, the places I go to, I don't even have to talk to a, a hostess or anybody. I can just go sit in my booth and the place where I sit, because it's kind of my place. And uh, some, they'll bring me the drink that I'm gonna drink without me even asking for it. And I, I like that familiarity, and I like that, that is, uh, there's no change involved in that, because like I said, there's enough variables in my life. And so I, I was thrown for a bit of a loop recently when somebody asked me to lunch, and I said, yeah, that'd be great. And before I could suggest one of my places, uh, my friend said, how about you meet me at this other place? And in a moment of weakness, I just said, Sure. <laughs> now here's the thing, the other place was a half an hour away from me. And I'd never been to this place. And I was gonna have to like put it in the, the phone and map it out and follow directions to get there. And you know, wasn't quite sure exactly how long it would take. And it was uh, the, the Tuckaway Tavern in Raymond, New Hampshire. I don't know if you guys have heard of this place. Okay, yeah, okay. So I, I, I realized that, that it's like a place that people go to. So then I'm like, uh-oh, what does that mean? Does it mean it's gonna be crowded? You know, is it gonna be hard to get a table? Or are we gonna have to wait a long time? So I'm getting some anxiety about lunch. And lunch, lunch is my friend. And I don't want lunch ruined, but I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm going to do this. So I went to Raymond, New Hampshire and uh, pulling into the parking lot, some jackalopes like riding my rear bumper. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I, I turn and there's a parking spot right up front and I'm just going to, I'm just going to park in it. I'm going to turn in and park in it. But this guy's like right on me. And I'm like, forget it. Cause I could tell he's one of these people that wants to go by that parking spot and then back into it. And I, I don't have time for that. I just don't have time for you backer uppers. And I, I'm like, I'm already, my wheels already shot off. I'm like, I'm gonna go park far away where I don't have to deal with the backer uppers. And so uh, I finally find a parking spot and I'm walking by where the backer upper was. It's my friend that I'm meeting for lunch. <laughs> and of course he's on the phone. That's it. So he gets out, I'm like, dude, backing into a spot, riding my bumper. He's like, yeah, and I was on the phone so I was distracted. I'm like, oh, okay. So we go in and uh, I'm like, listen, bro, you're gonna have to talk to them, okay? Cause there were, it was crowded, there were a lot of people. He's like, there may be a wait. I'm like, the only way I can do this is if I just chill out, blend into the background, you, you figure it out. And he goes, well, maybe we can sit at the bar. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> okay, that's a lot to take in here. And uh, so he goes up and he finds out there's like a 20 minute wait and he's at, and then I hear him asking about the bar, which I just, I don't have the guts to do that and put myself out there like that. They might reject me. And, <laughs> and he turns to me and he goes, Hey, they said, if there's an open seat at the bar, we can have it. So now I'm like, Oh, wow. Now we're going to go cram in between people or maybe ask somebody to move over. Anyway, we get over there. There's open seats at the bar. We sit down and uh, it's going fine. Everything's fine. But I, I'm, I haven't been able to like really look at the menu or anything when the waitress came over and she's like, are you ready to order? And my friend said, oh, sure. And he orders. And I'm like, oh, no. And I said, well, like, well, like, what's good here? And she says, well, um, have you ever seen the show Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives? And I said, no, but I, I've heard of it. She said, well, we're featured on that for this particular burger. It's called The Whole Tuckin' Farm. <laughs> I gotta hit that T, The Whole Tuckin' Farm. And I go, is it good? She's like, people like it. I go, I'll have it. Now, she brings me this burger and um, all I can tell you is it was a lot to process. Okay, because it's a, it's a slab of meat like that, cooked perfectly, by the way, I will give it a high rating. Uh, on top of the meat is a crispy fried chicken breast on top of the burger. Then on top of that, there is smoked bacon. On top of that is cheddar cheese. And then they had their tuck sauce. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and in that moment, I'm going, all right, this is a lot to process. And I, I can attest to the fact that two days later, it was still a lot to process. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
It was good. And I had a great experience, but it was a lot to process. And as I was kind of wrestling with that, I realized, you know what, that's a lot like Jesus. Jesus is a lot to process. I mean, he's good and he's a great experience, but he is a lot to process. There's, there's so much going on with, with Jesus, God in flesh and who he is. And, and so God is in the revealing business. He wants us to know him. We were created by God to be in a relationship with God. And so God is always making himself known to us. And religion is like an attempt to, to take God and, and put him into some kind of box that we can carry around with us and say, okay, we've got God figured out. But that's not the nature of a relationship. You don't figure someone out. You can't put them in a box. What, in a relationship, it's, it's alive and living and always revealing and we're always learning. And so here is God in his majesty and his glory and, and his power and his strength and he becomes flesh and blood like us. And he comes here for earth for the, for the reason of, of laying down his life for us to make a way for us to be with him forever. And this is who we find in Jesus and He's a lot to process. And yet he is in the revealing business and he wants to make himself known. He doesn't want us to figure him out or put him in a box or have all the answers. In fact, Jesus is the answer and he's an amazing answer. But every time we come to him and discover him as the answer, what really happens is we find even greater questions to ask. And the relationship grows. And so while Jesus was here on earth, he was always reminding people that, that he's in the revealing business. And so we're in this message series called Jesus Quotes, where we look at seven times in the New Testament where Jesus quoted from one of the Old Testament Psalms. And our memory verse is found in Luke 24, verse 44. And I hope that you'll read these words out loud with us. When we read scripture out loud and we memorize it together, it is good to hear God's words coming out of our mouth. So let's read his words out loud. It says, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So just in that one statement alone, that's a lot to process. Jesus is a lot to process because he's saying, hey, everything that you've, you've seen in the law, uh, all the prophets, all the, the law of Moses and the Psalms, the 39 Old Testament books, the oral tradition, the things that had been passed down, that he's saying, this is uh, about him. And all of those things must be fulfilled in him. And it was fulfilled in, in the way he lived, in the way he spoke, and what he did. And so Jesus is indeed a lot to process. The psalm that Jesus quotes from in Matthew 22 is Psalm 110. And I want you to kind of get the, uh, the stage that's set up before we, we dig into the quote in Matthew 22. What's, what's happening here is there is a group of religious leaders, two of them, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees and Sadducees were Jewish religious leaders who had a really tough job and a great responsibility taking care of the people and revealing the will of God in a communal aspect, plus taking the Old Testament law, the prophets and the Psalms, the very things that Jesus was talking about here, taking them uh, applying them in uh, an ever-changing cultural dynamic, interpreting them, and then even enforcing like the rules. And so it, it was a tough job. So the Pharisees themselves were actually lawyers. They were legal experts. They were lawyers. And so lawyers tend to uh, deal in complexity. So if you've ever had to sign a, a legal document, I know you didn't read it. The reason you probably, unless you're a lawyer, the reason you didn't read it was because you wouldn't have understood it if you did. And it would have been long and cumbersome and a whole lot to process. But the legal experts of Jesus' day, they came to question Jesus. Now, here's the thing about God and questions. I believe that God loves questions. He's a good father. As a dad, one of my favorite things about being a dad is I love questions. I'm not one of those dads that's like, shut up, ask your mom. I love questions. And so sometimes they might get on my nerves, but even from when they were little, the why questions, everything else, I want to try to explain it. Sometimes the answer is because I said so, and that's the most you're going to be able to comprehend and process at this time. But I like the questions because what's happening there is an opportunity for them to know my heart, what I'm trying to communicate to them, to get some more clarity. And that's the heart of our father. He wants us to know him. He invites us to question him and to ask. And so if you're skeptical, 
maybe even bordering on cynical at times, or you're exploring or investigating who is this God? What is this Jesus? What is this thing that you're talking about? Ask God. He's real. And he's in the revealing business, and he wants to make himself known. And I believe he loves questions, and I enjoy them too. Now, I, I like being asked questions, but I don't enjoy being questioned. So I have been on the, the receiving end of uh, having lawyers question me, where they, were, they had a point that they were trying to take me to and uh, an end result that they had already constructed and believed, and the line of questioning, they were questioning me, trying to get me to that point. And it was very frustrating, because I'm like, you're not actually trying to discover anything. You're not trying to learn anything right now. You're trying to prove something. And that's different. Questions are one thing. Being questioned is another. Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were questioning Jesus. They weren't really seeking, but they were, they were trying to trap Jesus in his words. And so in, in Matthew 22, we see that and the Pharisees had come up to him and they, they were trying to trap him and get people to kind of turn on. And so they came with like this kind of uh, political type question. They said, tell us, teacher, uh, taxes. Should the, should the Jewish people pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, if Jesus says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, then the people would have been like, yeah, we don't want it because they hated taxes. But then the Roman government would have been like, hey, that's not cool. And there would have been some significant issues there. And if Jesus said, no, pay taxes to Caesar, then the, you know, the people might turn on him and be like, well, you're not our guy. We're not, we don't want to follow you. We're looking for somebody to lead us in, in a nationalistic kind of freedom type thing. And so they asked Jesus this question. And Jesus says, OK, uh, do this. Bring me a coin. And so they bring him a coin. And he says, whose picture's on it? Caesar's. And he flips it out. Whose inscription's on it? They said, Caesar's. So Jesus says, well, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Ah, oh, drip. <laughs> right after that, it says that the, the Sadducees came up to Jesus and they had a question. And, and their question, the Sadducees, um, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They just believed that this time here on earth was all there was. And after you die, that's it. And that's why they were Sadducee, because they had no hope. I know, it's a really bad joke, but you're welcome. And uh, so they come to Jesus and they, they ask him this super complex, convoluted legal question where they construct this whole scenario where they say, OK, a man and a woman get married. Uh, the man dies and the man had seven brothers. And so our law says that if the man dies, his brother has to take the wife as his own. So he marries her and then he dies. And then the next brother does this all the way through seven brothers. First of all, I'm saying, you know, one of these brothers should have figured out this woman's a murderer. Like, <laughs> There's problems in the story already. I don't know who's marrying this, you know, this, this lady, but it's happening in their story. And they're like, in the resurrection, then, if she was married to all seven, then whose wife would she be in the resurrection? And, and Jesus is like, well, first of all, you guys don't even believe in the resurrection. So what, why are you trying to, to trap me with something you don't even believe in? Secondly, you're in error because you don't know the, the scriptures themselves, that people will neither be married nor given in marriage in the resurrection because as the family of God, we'll have a completeness there in that. And then the Pharisees come back and they're like, okay, well, you tell us what do you think the greatest commandment is? You know, the law and all the prophets. And Jesus says, oh, well, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And he was actually quoting from an Old Testament uh, book of the law, Deuteronomy. And they're like, oh, yeah, you nailed it. Good job, Jesus. And so right then, though, because they, they didn't really want to know. That's just they were testing him to see if he'd get it right. And then right there, we pick up in Matthew 22, verse 41. And it says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, they'd been questioning while they were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. And he said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So this is where we find our quote from Psalm 110. When Jesus was asked, uh, had them all there and they'd been questioning him, Jesus kind of flips it and says, now let me ask you guys a question. And he says, all right, who is the Messiah? 
If you don't think I'm the Messiah, then who do you think the Messiah will be? And they say, well, it'll be the son of, of David. So it would be a king in the lineage of David. Of course, with David kind of being the ultimate, David being the top dog, King David, like he was, he was the guy and everybody else like under David, under David, under David. But they're going to have one of those type kings under David. And Jesus says, oh, well, that's interesting because it says the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. This was David speaking. In Psalm 110, he's, he's quoting right from, from the Psalms that they were familiar with. And he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So if then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And so what, what Jesus was saying, no, the Messiah is actually over David. Well, this was a, a radical shift in thinking because no, wait, if this is greater than David, then that means that you know, they're not gonna control this Messiah. They're not going to manipulate this Messiah. They're not really even going to necessarily be able to identify and approve of and declare, yep, this can be the Messiah. It's not like they get a vote. They're not voting for the Messiah. It, what Jesus is saying is, no, the Messiah is. The Messiah is. And then right after that, it, this is really kind of fun. The next thing Jesus does is he fires them from their jobs which I just love, but listen, it's not me. He didn't fire them from their jobs because they were doing a bad job or because he was angry with them. But what he's saying is, is like, hey, this job that you guys have been doing, it's not going to be needed anymore. We're not going to need people to uh, have to interpret this law, apply it in an ever-changing cultural dynamic and enforce it because now you'll have the Messiah. You'll have a savior. Now there will be grace expressed, not just the hope of grace to come. And so Jesus um, then says, he tells the people that were there right in front of the Pharisees right after this, he looks at the people in the crowd and he says, by the way, don't be like these guys. They're hypocrites. They've, they've gotten so wrapped up in, in their job and what they think they're doing that they can't even process or see what my father is doing. And so then he goes on and he gives what's called the seven woes to the teachers of the law. And he, he says, okay, you're slamming the door uh, to the kingdom in people's faces. He says, you're blind guys, blind guides. You're, uh, you're, like, you're so legalistic that you're, you're taking a tenth of your spices. He's saying basically you're tithing your spice rack but ignoring the needs that are available and right in front of you. And that uh, they neglected justice and mercy and faithfulness. He compared them to dirty dishes and empty tombs and called them snakes and a brood of vipers. Brood of vipers. He's like, yeah, you gone. <laughs> he's like, cause I'm, I'm here. And so boy, Jesus, he's a lot to process, but that's okay because we discover that Jesus is the ultimate. The ultimate. Now, those can be tough for us because we don't necessarily understand the ultimate. Like we throw this word ultimate around kind of haphazardly or you know, just pretty flimsily. Like I, I, there's a TV show called The Ultimate Fighter. It's in season 30 right now. <laughs> season 30 of The Ultimate Fighter. Like, I guess, I guess it wasn't the ultimate in season one <laughs> or two or three. And and, and that's the thing is, I think we're looking for an ultimate when there's a lot to process. I, I know, for instance, like after I ate um, the whole tuck and farm, um, the next day, uh, I still had a lot to process. And so I went to the drugstore to get some help processing. And I was going down the aisle with like the Pepto and the antacids and there was Mylanta. And I noticed there were four different kinds of Mylanta to choose from. There was regular strength Mylanta, extra strength Mylanta, maximum strength Mylanta, and are you ready for it? Ultimate Mylanta. <laughs> I'm like, if we got ultimate already, why are we making the other three? And that's where, where Jesus was coming in saying, all right, listen, I am above David because I was before David. And this is what David said about me. I am the ultimate. So we can find this in him. We don't need regular strength or extra strength or maximum strength when ultimate strength is available. And so we dig into Psalm 110. We'll read the whole Psalm. It's just seven verses uh, that Jesus quoted from. And so it begins with the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing 
On your day of battle, arrayed in splendor, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on that day, on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way. And so he will lift his head high. And so this is a Psalm of David talking about the Messiah prophesying about who would be to come. And Jesus is quoting from this in regards to the being questioned about who he is and about the Messiah and telling them that, listen, I, I am. And so when we think about Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate. And so in this, in this Psalm that Jesus quotes from, there's, there's three distinct roles of the Messiah that are here. Jesus is the ultimate king. We see that in the first three verses. King David, uh, who was like a king who was after God's own heart, who, you know, had prophesied that the Messiah would come from his lineage, which Jesus could trace his lineage to David. Jesus is this ultimate king. But the Lord said to my Lord, um, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. And so he is the ultimate king. Uh, Jesus is also the ultimate priest. So in verses four through five, uh, we see that Jesus will be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so he is a, a priest where basically when he is now firing the, the religious leaders and saying, okay, your role is not even needed anymore, it's because we have the ultimate priest. The ultimate priest. So we didn't need another priest. We don't need a, a priest to go and confess our sins to a, a priest. Now we can I'm not saying that it's wrong, but we don't need that because we already have a priest who has done this for us once and for all. And so he has handled it and he's finished it because so, he's the ultimate priest. And then he is the ultimate judge. That in the end, that everything will be under his authority and he will judge everything and everyone. He is the ultimate judge. So ultimate king, ultimate priest, and ultimate judge. So if we already have the ultimate, then we have no need for a regular strength king or an extra strength king or a maximum strength king. We can stop looking for all of that because we have the ultimate king. And if we have the ultimate priest, then we don't need a regular strength priest or an extra strength priest or a maximum strength priest because we have the ultimate strength priest. And if we already have the ultimate judge, then we don't need a regular strength judge or an extra strength judge or a maximum strength judge because we have the ultimate strength judge. And so here's the deal. If, if in our own hearts we say, okay, if Jesus is the ultimate king, then there's no need for any other kings. That means I, I don't need to be a king. That, I would think that would be one of the, the chief things that we do is we try to position ourselves as kings, rulers of our own lives, masters of our own destinies, large and in charge of our worlds and all the things that we're manipulating. And maybe you're regular strength or maybe you're extra strength, maybe you're even maximum strength, but you're no match for the ultimate king. And so if you try to be your own king, then now you're going to war against the ultimate king. Yeah. And I can tell you exactly how that's gonna end. I've tried it, I've done it, because that war, you don't wanna know where it happens, it happens inside, on the inside. There is a war that is raging on the inside, battling between who we were created to be under his authority in relationship to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the ultimate Kings, trying to knock him off the throne, and we're miserable, and because we're miserable on the inside, and there's so much turmoil and strife on the inside, it comes out of us, and it impacts every relationship that we have. You wanna know why there's no peace in the world? Because there's no peace in here. You cannot have outer peace until you have inner peace. And Jesus came and made a way for us to have peace with him, but there's only one king, he's the ultimate king, and we don't need any other kings. It's good news. He's the ultimate priest, which means we don't need any other priests. We don't gotta to go to him, we don't gotta look for him. I, I, I know it bothers people sometimes, but I'm like, listen, I, I, don't, I don't even want to be called, you know, Pastor Bo. I don't, I don't like people. I don't, maybe you think that's weird, but I'm like, could, I just, what do you want to be called? I'm like, I don't, I'd like to be called by my name. You just call me Bo. I don't, I don't necessarily like the titles and stuff there because what we can do is we can elevate people to a position that they don't need to be in because Jesus has done this. You have access to him. 
You have direct access to him. There is no barrier between you and God anymore. He has made a way for you to speak to him directly and to go before him and to have your sins taken care of once and for all. He is the ultimate king and the ultimate priest. And you don't need a regular strength priest. Or in my case, maximum strength. (laughs) When you have the ultimate priest. And then we have the ultimate judge. I think I, we could all probably agree. We don't want any more judges. That's kind of the chief complaint everybody has. Like, I don't want to be judged. Don't judge me. All right, good. There's, there's one judge and he's the ultimate judge. This is good news. And so Jesus is the ultimate. And then ultimately, the reason Jesus is the ultimate is because Jesus is perfect. He is perfect. In him, there is no imperfection, but Jesus became our imperfection and took it inside of himself on the cross and put it to death in his body to make a way for us to receive his perfection so that we can be with him forever. And so this issue of Jesus being a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, it's actually quoted again in Hebrews chapter seven, verse 17 through 28. And I want you to hear about your perfect king, your perfect priest and your perfect judge. It says, for it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints his high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. Jesus is perfect and he's exactly what I need and what you need. This issue of being a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek came before there was the law, before there was the promise delivered to Abraham through his son Isaac and the offspring that would come before God made a people for himself. Abraham uh, uh, gave a tenth of everything to Melchizedek, the priest. And so for Jesus to be in this order, it's again saying he has been there from the beginning and he will be there to the end. He is always with us. And so because he laid down his life and put our sin to death inside his body and conquered death and rose from the grave. He is the perfect savior. Now he has made a way. That's why there is no sacrificial system any longer. The temple where the sacrifices were made day after day and year after year, it was destroyed in 70 AD. 35 years after Jesus' death, it's never been rebuilt because there's no longer a need for it. The new order has come, but it was God's plan from the beginning. And Jesus has made a way. And so I hope that you can boldly ask any question you have of him. But I hope that you'll seek him. Because when you seek him, not seek to trap him, not seek to define him, not seek to control him, but seek to know him. When you seek him, you will find him and he will reveal himself to you. And so no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, he is available to you. And one of the ways that we remember who he is and what he's done is when we share communion together. 
how Jesus gave himself to us. On the night of his arrest, he took bread and broke it. And he offered, he said, this is my body which is given for you. Eat in remembrance of him. And if you want to know him, and to follow him, and to receive his perfection, what he has done for you, then this is an invitation to receive. Let's eat together. And Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of a new covenant. A new way. Not the old sacrificial system anymore, but a once and for all sacrifice where his blood was poured out for us. And Jesus, our perfect priest, our perfect judge, and our perfect king, the ultimate, he shed his blood for you. And you're invited to take drink. We drink to the king. I'd like to pray a blessing over us. And I'm going to ask God to maybe reveal a new question to you that you can lay before him and then be still and listen and see how he answers. He's in the revealing business and I know, I'm confident he'll reveal himself to you. So I wanna pray for us and then let's spend some time meeting with him. Father, we thank you that you've given your son Jesus and that you have made a way for us to be with you forever. And since you're the ultimate, we don't need to look somewhere else. Father, I do pray right now that you would reveal a new question to each of us, something to ask of you. And help us to ask you right now and to listen to you and to see you with fresh eyes and to worship you with living hearts. We ask for that in Jesus' name.